my birth name is Frances Anne Ballantyne, and I was born on May the 20th, 1935. My mother's name was Frances Elizabeth Stevens, and my father's Murray Gordon Ballantyne. She was the only child of my grandmother, Hazel, and my grandfather, Francis Chatham Stevens, whom I never met because he died very young. And for my mother, and I think for all of us, the defining feature of my grandmother's life was the fact that on the boat, the Lusitania, that was torpedoed by the Germans, was her mother-in-law, Mrs. George Washington Stevens, her son, John, and the nanny and the maid, and they all drowned. So my grandmother lost her son as a baby, and her mother-in-law, and her husband at the time was very ill with trench fever, and he died in the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918. So as a very young woman, she'd lost her husband, her son, and her mother-in-law. And this echoes down through the family and certainly influenced my mother greatly. And my grandfather, Ballantyne, was a very successful businessman and politician. They lived in the Square Mile in Montreal. Uh, my father had two older brothers, Charles and, and James. And they always all lived in Montreal. Grandfather's work involved him in traveling quite a lot, conferences. And he and my grandmother were invited to the coronation of George VI. This was because of his political work. So both my parents grew up in very comfortable, large, wealthy houses as indeed had my grandmother. So all of that changed drastically for them over the course of the last century. And what they had grown up to expect to be their standard of living turned out not to be so. I, I think as far as I can tell, by my grandmother and grandfather Stevens were very happy with each other, but they didn't have very long. I mean, they were married in 1912, and he volunteered in 1914. By early 1915, he was very sick with fever. And after that, he was semi-invalid, and then he died in 1918. So my mother only has vague memories of somebody who had to be helped up and down the stairs. So perhaps they were very much in love with each other and had been very happy, but it was certainly taken away from them very quickly. Plus their son. So that's a, that's a hard way to begin your adult life. My grandmother's hair went white. She was a very young woman and her hair went white. So I never knew her other than with white hair. And then a, a, a few days, years later, she married Arthur Colville. And my mother has very good memories of him. He seems to have made a, a good effort to be a stepfather to her. And I think he and my grandmother were happy, but the problem was she wanted to have more children, and it turned out he couldn't. I don't know what the correct word is, but anyway, there were no more children. So that was another sadness for her. And then he died in, well, I, I don't remember the exact date. I think they were married only for 10 or 11 years, so very short. And he'd been earning very well, and she discovered after he died that the widow's pension from the Sun Life Insurance was miserable. 
So that didn't help. I remember her as being a, a very elegant woman, very quiet, very reserved, not very active. It was, I, I don't think any of us could get to know her very well, but she enjoyed my company, so of course I enjoyed being with her. So I was her first grandchild. And I think I was quite a cute little girl, so <laughs> she enjoyed that. I used to play cards with her a bit. And she, she, she played hard. She played to win. So did I. <laughs> There's a story about her being invited to play bridge with the parish priest in Mascouche. So that must have been in French. Apparently, she acquitted herself <laughs> adequately. There was a lot of whiskey. <laughs> well, I, I can't quite make out how, how she was viewed by, by the people around who saw what she was doing. I mean, she must, she, I, I think she, people seem to have found her very imposing. I, I didn't. <laughs> she was she was she was very reserved and very quiet, but she was a, a pleasant granny to me. Both my grannies were very nice. But um, it it was all very formal. It was, you know, I, I was thinking back. Uh, nobody would have worn blue jeans, let alone blue jeans with torn knees. I mean, this was absolutely inconceivable. So the whole of life was much more formal. So she didn't take me on her knee or sort of play physical games with me the way a, a young granny might these days. And she had a, a, a beautiful Korean, I think Korean or Japanese chest, which lived in the living room. And it had costumes in it. So when it was a rainy day, she would open it up and take the costumes out and we'd try them on. There was a spectacular peacock one that she'd apparently worn at a costume ball in Montreal long, long ago. So that was really the only thing she ever told me about her, her life as a young woman. It was a spectacular costume. And then there was a Quaker one. I don't know why she had the Quaker one, but I got the Quaker one. <laughs> And she tried that on me, and we, we played with it. So I think I'm seeing somebody very different to the way maybe the people of Mascouche saw her. But she didn't have all that much to do with us at Mascouche because there were nannies. And I would go off walking. I explored the countryside on my own. I walked everywhere I could as far as just I had to be back for lunch. So that was the only limit. So I walked all around the area around the house and the farm. The overwhelming memory for me and for my sister Elizabeth and brother Hugh is that it, it was so beautiful. It was like being in heaven. No school. Nobody telling us what to do. <laughs> and this beautiful house and wonderful countryside. So I spent a lot of time there. And of course, there was a field on the other side that the cows went to sometime. And I discovered that there was even another field even beyond that that nobody told me about. I don't, it never seemed to get used either. The cows, well, they were a Holstein Frisian herd. Um, I think I can guess why my grandmother involved herself in farming, because she knew nothing about it. But her father had built himself a wonderful country place on Pigeon Lake, which is in the Kawarthas here. 
and there was a big house and there was a sort of lodge. It's not, not a very pretty house, but a very dramatic site. And he set up a farm, an ideal farm. And I think that's probably where my grandmother got the idea that she was going to have a farm. So she did, but I hate to think what it cost her. I mean, it, it, she had to have a farm manager to, to, to run it. Obviously, she couldn't do anything. So there, there were chickens, and so we, had, well, we, we ate well, pigs, and three horses. That's, I remember all sorts of farming that, that just doesn't exist anymore. Like coming back from the hayfield, sitting up on top of the hay wagon with great big pressure on, gray pressure on horses pulling us. All these things now that you read in stories that I actually experienced. And of course that was during the war, so gasoline was rationed as well, so the horses were needed. So there was so much to explore. It was really wonderful and so beautiful. There was the lovely driveway. Well, that had already been there. And then she planted a whole lot of spruce hedges, which are still there, which is rather funny. Then there was a, a huge pool, so there was a pool garden with a herbaceous border beside it. And next to that was what I was told was an orchard. There were a few fruit trees in it, but they never seemed to do anything, and nobody ever did anything to them. Then beyond that, there was the rose garden with the shallow pond, which I think is still there. And beyond that, again, was the tennis court and the little house for children to play in. And beside all of it was the long walk beside the river with the willow trees. Now the vegetable garden was the other side of the house and, and all the buildings and the old mill. Huge vegetable garden. So I could go there and explore that too. And it was great fun to play amongst the asparagus because they're so, so huge feathery plants. So there was a lot of gardening to be done and a lot of grass to cut. And usually, usually in the afternoon we used to swim, but that did come to an end during the war because it was impossible to get anybody to look after the pool or to get the materials you needed to keep it clean. And it got dirtier and dirtier, so it was all covered with scum. It wasn't much fun. Once I went swimming and there were a whole lot of frogs, and I really didn't like that either. So in the end, we stopped swimming. I remember one summer my grandmother made an effort. She, she got it emptied and cleaned and refilled, but it took a week to empty it and a week to fill it. So that did give us a little time with it being clean, but, but really it, it, it was pretty hopeless. One of, one of the disastrous byproducts of the war. At the manor, she had her own personal maid. Then there was a table maid, I guess you would call her, and a cook. And the cleaners, I guess, must have come from the village or from some, somewhere else. There must have been people who cleaned, but I don't remember them. And then there was the gardener and his family living in, in their little house by the mill. And the chauffeur, because my grandmother couldn't drive. She'd really grown up living a, a very wealthy life. So since, since there were cooks and maids and everything, you know, I never had to see any work being done. I never had any feeling that, you know, food just arrived. So it, it was wonderful. It was heaven. You didn't have to do anything. Life just flowed on. Anyway, it was always the great moment when we drove through the, through the gates, which, as I say, I very rarely seen shut. And then there was the drive round to the front door, which was a, 
uh, and then you could see, of course, the whole facade of the house. And quite a big front door. The slightly odd thing was that that front door took you right in to the main living room. So, of course, we didn't use it in the winter. In the winter, we had to come in through the old kitchen in, in the back and leave all our winter clothes. But anyway, you come in into this, this main room, which was the main living room, and there was a big table on the left and a tapestry, and the table was, well, people left things, a mail, and there were some flowers, and usually some umbrellas sitting in a corner. And immediately on the right was the desk where my grandmother wrote her le Well, she, no, she, no, she didn't write her letters there. But there was a desk, and that's where she kept track of, of all, all the farm stuff, because she had to do a little drawing of each calf that was born to register it, because they were a registered herd. Anyway, there were carpets, what they called Wakara carpets. That, that's a particular sort from the, the middle of Asia. And then a door on the left, which went to the guest wing and to the pantry and kitchen. Another big cupboard, and then stairs up to the dining room. And then next to that, a door and stairs down to the old kitchen. And the furniture was two big sofas and some chairs, and a big fireplace, and some old guns on the wall over the fireplace. I don't think I ever saw a fire there, perhaps, perhaps in the winter. And that was the full width of the house, so there were windows on both sides. So if you followed the front of the house from that big living room hall, the next room was my grandmother's dining room, uh, my grandmother's drawing room, which was decorated in a completely different way, quite opulent, very heavy silk curtains and a sort of, I don't remember the rug, it was probably French. And the piano you mentioned in your notes that Chopin was supposed to have played on. I think my grandmother believed that. I doubt if anybody else did. <laughs> I don't think by then it was very playable at all because I never saw anybody tuning it, but it was very pretty. And she had there her desk and her table and another fireplace with a painting over which of Venice, which she said was a canaletto, and that certainly failed to convince anybody else at all. There was no question it was not a canaletto. However, I guess she was happy thinking it was. And um, furniture, rather sort of Louis XV furniture. And then there was a small door that took you out onto the big stone terrace. So if we come back from that room and go through the door on the left, there's a little hall with another big chest and the stairs upstairs and the stairs down to my grandmother's suite where she had a big cupboard for her clothes and a bathroom and her bedroom and a little oratoire. And she had all that decorated all in sort of gray, green, silky colors. And it looked out into the little courtyard in between the, the dining room wing and her wing, and then onto the long lawn beside the river. And, and there was just, just on the left with the, what we always called the falls, which is really a dam, but we called it the falls. And the area there of the river was very shallow. It ran over very sort of curious stony formation. I don't know what a geologist would call it, but anyway, you could walk through it quite easily. And at the back of the house, of course, you always heard the sound of the water coming over the dam, particularly in the spring when there was a lot of water. 
So if you come back from my grandmother's room and come up the stairs to the little hall, there's another small bedroom then and another small door out onto the stone terrace. So that was the, the full measure of the stone terrace. And there was another area beside it, which was a screen porch. The main terrace didn't have screens, but it did have an awning. And up the stairs, the first thing was the wing of where my parents had their rooms and their bathroom, and that was on top of my grandmother's wing. And then you come up the stairs again, and there was a room called the, the L room because it did that. And that's usually where I stayed, and that was the corner of the house, so you could look over the pool or you could look over the driveway and the field and the hill with the pines. And there was another bathroom there, and then there was a room that was called the library. It had a lot of books in it. They rather looked as though they'd been bought by the yard. Nobody ever looked at them except me. <laughs> Some of them were very interesting. So on a rainy day when I couldn't walk around all over the place, I looked at these books and I looked at all sorts of fascinating places that I thought I'd never see. And to my amazement, some of them I did manage to travel to. So that room had various ordinary furniture and an, a lovely big Persian carpet and a very good piano, which nobody ever played and then steps up to what we called the dormitory, which was a bedroom over the dining room. And then steps into the staff wing, where there was, was a long room, which was sort of where all the linen was kept and sewing was done and mending and ironing. And there were three, two, three or four bedrooms in the bathroom there for my grandmother's maid and the cook and the maid. And that was all over the, what the area underneath that, which was the pantry and the kitchen and the servants' dining room, which was a lovely dining room, the size of both these rooms. Oh, I forgot to mention, when you came in the main door and you went left, there were guest bedrooms, two bedrooms in the bathroom also very decorated. I think my grandmother did a decorating, short decorating, interior decorating course in New York before she addressed herself to this house. The guest bedrooms were all very green and silky. The bathroom matched it, it was green. All the bathrooms matched whatever area they were in. My mother's and father's was blue because their, their rooms were mostly blue. It, it was a um, it was the great work of my grandmother's life. And it was fascinating, the, the house and the history and the dam, the mill. I suppose she fell in love with it. Well, he fell in love with her, obviously. It was Bennett, is it Richard Rodney Bennett? Yeah. I'm not quite sure on the dates. Mascouche was already functioning because I think he, he visited it. So anyway, he did fall in love with her and he came to propose to her, presumably that was the house in Pine Avenue. And she refused him. And he was so upset when he went out that he left his cane which we still have. What he didn't know was that she was doing him a favor because she would have been a disaster as a political wife, a complete disaster. She was much too shy and reserved. He had his sister campaigning with him, and as far as I could see, she was doing a much better job than my grandmother could ever possibly have done. She traveled with, with Mr. Colville because he worked for the Sun Life Insurance and that involved him in traveling. She loved traveling. After his death, 
when she got my school shawl set up, she went traveling. I've read my mother's diary from the late 1930s, and it consists all, almost entirely of her driving out to Mascouche to, to manage whatever needed to be managed, because my grandmother was somewhere else. She was actually caught in Europe at the beginning of the war. And I, I think she wasn't in any hurry to leave, but um, Pauline Vanier who managed to collect her and her things and get her to, on a ship while it was still possible and get her back. I don't know what rank the Vanniers had at the time, but anyway, they were there. So then during the war, the only traveling she could do was, was to the Caribbean, and there was no going to Europe. Rather cheekily, I think, she, she wanted to go to the Caribbean, but you could only take limited amounts of money out of Canada, and she couldn't get enough out to finance her Caribbean trip. So she actually wrote to Bennett, who was then living in England, and got him to fix the situation for her, which he did. <laughs> so she went to the Bahamas, and the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were he was the governor in the Bahamas. That was his exile to keep him out of the way I, so he couldn't do any damage to the war effort. So my grandmother met them. She played bridge with the Duchess. He didn't play bridge. He just hung around big board, I think. But she played bridge with the Duchess. That's one of her claims to fame. Well, her money situation was deteriorating all the time. And Mascouche was soaking up lots of money just to even keep it minimally functioning. So after the war, no, she, she, did, she went to Florida in the winters and that, that was it, no more traveling. But from my mother's diary, she spent an awful lot of time looking after Mascouche while Granny was away. And it took a lot of looking after. But for me and my sister Elizabeth and brother Hugh, this is our image of paradise, and we carry that with us forever. So you could say to that extent, certainly my grandmother succeeded. 